What's going on everybody? Brian from Angling Anarchy here and this week's video is coming from the Wanakee Muskie School held by Capital City Muskie Zinc. It's a really cool opportunity for people who are of all skill levels to go check out a, um, a myriad of different classes. They've got so many different classes, poolside demos. The class I taught was about filming muskie fishing. So that's this week's video. I hope you enjoy it. If you have questions, leave them in the comments below. I will answer them as best I can. So with that, go ahead and enjoy this little talk that I gave, I guess. So what we're going to go through is the two things that you absolutely need to know to make this not a hassle out in the boat. Uh, powering the camera continuously, which I'm doing there, there, here with little power packs. We'll go over that. And then uh, maximizing the SD card space with a process called looping. So we'll go over that in great detail. We'll go over some of the settings to optimize the camera uh, for different situations in the boat, uh, slow motion, that sort of thing if you really want to get a little bit more advanced with some of the stuff. I've got, you know, if, when we're all done, if you have questions about any of the accessories, any of the stuff I use, I brought everything uh, for the most part. So we'll go over that. Head versus chest mount is always a contentious debate on the Facebook. So we'll go over the reason why I prefer this, but also just advantages, disadvantages for both, uh, both ways of wearing a camera. How to be creative with your camera placement. There's really, other than the YOLO tech stick, which I have and we'll talk about that, there's really nothing that you can just go to a store and buy and say, I've got a 1750 Fishhawk, I need a pole for my cameras. They're, you just have to make it for the most part. Um, keeping your files organized and then maybe a little bit about editing film if we, if we have time towards the end. So why on earth would you listen to me? And we'll start from the least important to the most important. Uh, 30 years fishing experience, probably more than that, quite honestly. I was one of the kids, and still am, if we drive past a body of water, I'm wondering what's in there, and I want to find out <laughs> desperately, so I've always been like that. Uh, I started really concentrating on muskie fishing in the early, like, 2011, 2012, when uh, uh, my father-in-law, Rick Albers, and I started East Sox Assault Tackle. We started making bucktails and going to muskie shows and wondering what in the world we were doing there, because people were just walking past us going, we have no idea who you are, uh, but you have to just get over that real quick. And uh, I still I still help out with Chaos Tackle. Um, yep, started the YouTube channel May of 2018, so I guess it's almost five years. Prior to that, I had uh, worked with a young gentleman in, uh, who lives in Exonia, makes uh, Echo Tail baits. I don't know if you guys have ever seen those, but his name is Justin Blanchard. He and I were kind of monkeying around with a little YouTube channel. Uh, so I kind of got my feet wet doing that, and then I was able to start Angling Anarchy. Uh, fun fact, the reason I called it Angling Anarchy was I didn't want to make a Chaos Tackle channel because I knew if we ever sold it, I wanted to be able to keep ownership of it. So my buddy and I started brainstorming, and he's like, well, Anarchy is like Chaos. I'm like, okay, we're starting good. He goes, Angling Anarchy, we have alliteration. I was like, that's a winner. Let's go with it. So, uh, And then the, the logo is just the anarchy symbol with a little J hook through it. So really simple, but it worked out pretty nice. Uh, when I first started the YouTube channel, I was very... It's a flashback to school. Man. Oh, I know, to totally. <laughs> 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 Sit back, all <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I was just uploading videos whenever I had content or whenever I had time to. And the more I started looking into how do you actually have a successful YouTube channel? I started watching more YouTube videos about how to do that than I did fishing videos. And the one thing that was consistent through every single video was consistency, was if you want to build an audience, you have to, they have to know when you're going to upload stuff. So starting in August of 2019, I started uploading a video every Saturday at 8.30. And there have been a lot of Saturdays or a lot of weeks where I'm like, nah, it's not going to happen this week. And then there's just that little voice in the back of my head that's like, no, you got a good streak going. Just, just make something. So I've um, been doing that. I'm at 12.5 subscri 12 thousand subscribers, and I've got 257 videos, over 3 million views for what it's worth, I suppose. All right, we'll get into the actual camera stuff. 
So I'm sure you've noticed, those of you that have used GoPros, the battery life is less than, less than desirable. It's maybe an hour and a half, if you're lucky. If it's cold out, it's less than that. Uh, if it's an old battery, it's less than that. So that is not only a problem with a single camera, because I don't want to be killing an hour, and, or, you know, five, 10 minutes every hour and a half to you know, possibly change my camera angle that I might already have set up and looking nice and have to monkey around with putting a new battery in there. So it's, it's just a hassle to change constantly, especially times that by five, six, seven, it really starts to become a problem. So you're better off for the most part, unless you've got like an underwater camera that you wanna use, I still use batteries for those. But if, if I'm going to do any amount of filming, you, you almost have to power these things continuously. And the best way to do that I've found is either by having, you know, most boats have a cigarette lighter. You can get one of those little adapters that plugs in that has two USB uh, A ports in them, and you can power cameras that way. The, well, I'll get to that later. Uh, so the 12 volt off the boat works really well. I use a lot of these. These are the little um, packs that you'd use to charge your cell phone. Um, these work really nice. They're Anker 13,000 milliamp hour. Um, and I've got all the stuff that I use. If you go to any one of the videos on the YouTube channel, I've got a list of, of all the stuff with links to it. So it's, it's pretty easy to find the stuff that I use. How long does that last? Uh, typically, if it's brand new, 16 hours. Running a, you know, a, a, I run fours and sevens are the GoPros I run, but I, the power... Uh, draw for most of them should be similar. Um, so yeah, I can usually get through a day's worth of fishing with, with one of the battery packs. I forgot to bring one, but the, the tool battery adapters, I don't know, I've got Milwaukee Tools. I know Makita, DeWalt, pretty much everybody that, that has an, like an 18 or 12 volt lithium battery. There's a little slide that will slide on top that has a USB port in it. And one of those, like a five amp hour Milwaukee battery will run a GoPro for probably two days straight. So if you've got those laying around, that's a nice, easy source of, uh, of power to use without having to buy. I think these things are $35, give or take. So they're not super expensive, but if you've already got something that you can use, then that's probably the best way to go. So just out of curiosity, what model GoPro do you have? A nine? Five, okay, anybody else? Five. Five, okay. So the Hero 3s and 4s, some, some people are still using them. Those were a little bit touchier to power consistently because you either had to hook into the, uh, it's a USB mini port on the side and you had to have the battery in the GoPro. So basically in a sense what you're doing is charging the battery but also using the GoPro. So the problem there is the GoPro would start to overheat sometimes. Um, they do, there's a company called Switronics that makes one that plugs into the back of threes and fours and you take the battery out and it just powers it with this and you don't have the overheating issues. That was the big issue back in the day when guys were trying to power these continuously was, was overheating them. Luckily for most of you, the Heroes 5 through, I know they've got 11s, they might have 12s, I lose track anymore. They just, they keep cranking these things out. But you can power a five through whatever they've got now just through a USB cord. It's a USB-C port on the side, but you definitely want to take the battery out because if you don't take the battery out, it'll keep shutting itself off. So um, take the internal GoPro battery out and then you just buy a USB-A to USB-C cord, whatever length you need. And that's what's running this guy right now out, out of the side. So. Um, they've made it a lot easier to, to power these things. I mentioned the Yolo Tech stick. I don't know if any of you guys have seen this, but they're, they're neat little units. They weren't making these when I first started filming, but uh, it just plugs into the power adapter for your light. So you can either have it front of the boat, back of the boat, uh, and it just draws from the 12 volt system in your boat. It's got two USB ports up here. So it's, it's a cool option if you don't want to monkey around with making your own setup, trying to find some, some way to... Uh, YOLO Tech? Yep, yep. 
Um, they're about $150 or so. They have smaller ones. This is one of the ones that extends out a little ways. The problem with this, or the only problem I have with it, um, let's go to the advantages first. If you put this in the back corner of the boat, you basically cover the whole boat. The disadvantage is, is the guy in the front of the boat looks like he's 20 yards away, um, depending on the setting that you use, uh, whether it's a wider or linear view on the GoPro. But it does it, it covers everything, but you know, if you've just got a single camera, that's probably the best best thing to do. I don't like them because you've only got one point of contact with the boat. So they do recommend if you're going to run with this uh, and you want to leave it up, there's a screw in adapter. You don't just want one of the like compression adapters that some boats have. Uh, and they also recommend to not have it extended if you're running. So it's not a big deal, but a disadvantage nonetheless. All right, so powering. Does anybody have any questions about powering the cameras? That just powering them continuously eliminates 50% of the headaches, I think anyway. Um, makes, it makes things a lot nicer out in the boat. So the next thing is going to be looping. Um, I like using the SanDisk Extreme. They're a little red and gold SD card. Uh, they hold up really well to looping, which we'll talk about next. Um, I haven't had any of them. I, I've had other cards, Le Lexan, Lexar. I can't remember what the name of the company was, but occasionally I would go to get footage off them. I would get it off of them and then I would go to format it and it was like, hmm, we're not working anymore. So the best thing to do with that then is to just throw it away because there's really no way to fix it. But the SanDisk extremes hold up really well. So looping. Does anybody know what looping is? Does anybody use that function? Got a yes in the back, yes? Okay. Okay, cool. <laughs> okay. It, it, yeah, it can be a little bit tricky. So I'll try to explain it the best I can. So looping lets you film continuously throughout a 5, 10, 15, however many hour day that you're out on the water. And it will not fill up the SD card because what it's doing, and I'll use the five minute loop as an example is the camera starts filming from zero seconds to one minute and it saves that as a little discrete file and it starts filming the next minute and it saves that as a little discrete file and then it films the third and the fourth and the fifth and as it's getting done with the sixth minute and starts filming the seventh it takes that first minute and gets rid of it and then it films the eighth minute and gets rid of the second minute so you're constantly moving along, getting rid of old files while you're creating new files. So that's why you can start it at 8 in the morning and it's whatever you're doing, you're filming, you're filming. You catch a fish at 10, you get it in the net and you hit stop, record on the camera and from that point where you hit stop back five plus minutes because I say plus because you're gonna have one file that's somewhere between 1 and 59 seconds. It saves that portion right there, and everything that happened before that's gone. So that's nice because now you just fish two hours, you caught a fish, and you had the camera running the whole time, you caught the hook set, you got everything, but you only have f five to six minutes saved on the camera. Super helpful, I think. There are some guys that will film all day and just let it roll, and when something happens, they'll hit stop. So that when they're editing, they know that, you know, of this four hour clip, the last five minutes is all I need. But then you're buying bigger SD cards. They're more expensive. I find bigger SD cards to be less reliable for some reason. 32 and 64 gigabyte, I never have a problem with. So, and, and I typically film with a five minute loop. GoPro, I don't know why they don't have a 10 minute loop, but they don't. It goes from five to 20. So the five minute loop saves in little one minute chunks, which when I'm editing is awesome because it's easy to deal with then. The 20 minute, I, can, I think it's a five minute. So it saves four full five minute chunks and then a partial uh, fifth chunk. So when you actually open up your folder, this is 
this is one five minute loop, basically. So you've got your one, two, three, four, five full one minute files, and this is a partial down here. Yes? Um, does it put the files for each loop into a discrete folder? They're all in the same folder. So, so and, and you'll be able to kind of tell like where one stops and starts just by the, you know, um, the, the name sometimes you can look at or the date or, I mean, you, you, it's basically like the same number five times and then a small number so you can kind of see where you're, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and I'll go through how I save files and, and you know, that, that's, that's the other thing is you've got all these files, now what do you do with them and how do you keep track of them and that sort of thing. So I'll, I'll touch on that. Um, all right, that's all that. So when I, when I pull that into my editing software, I've got this, and this isn't the same files that was in the previous, this is just another loop, but you've got one, two, three, four, five full minutes, and then here's my little partial. So this is where the action, or this is where I decided to stop the camera, and that's the five minutes, five seconds, or whatever it is previous to that. Um, Cyberlink Power Director. I, Cyberlink, yep, yep. Um, they market it as like a prosumer, so it's not professional, it's not, it's somewhere in the middle. Uh, I find it works really nice. I didn't go with, so if you're using a Mac, it's a power cut, I think, is kind of your top level one. Adobe Premiere Pro would be the same for, uh, for Windows users. The problem with at least Adobe, which is what I was kind of looking at when I first started doing this, it's a subscription base, so it's twenty dollars a month for however you want to use it. I wanted to buy the software and, and have it, so that's why I went with the Cyberlink. Um, I use it. I know Noah from Madison Angling; he uses it as well. So uh, I've, I've turned a lot of people onto it, and I've had nothing but good things said back to me about it. So uh, it seems to be a pretty nice piece of software. It, it does everything I need to do. It's, I mean, it's way more powerful than what, what I would be using it for. So, um, you know, unless you're editing for Discovery Channel or something like that, I don't think you really need <laughs> anything too fancy. And you're on Windows? You're yeah, on Windows. yep. All right, so as far as, as settings for the, for the GoPros especially, um, You've got your diff different resolutions, 720, 960, 1080 is the most common, 2.7K and then 4K. I, you know, between all those five, 1080 and 4K are probably the most common ones that people are familiar with. Um, 1080 is 1080 vertical pixels, 1920 horizontal pixels. 4K is named for the amount of horizontal pixels, so you've got I can't remember what it is. Basically, you've got four times as many pixels in a square inch of 4K as you do 1080. So for anything I'm doing, I don't need 4K. Again, if I was filming for Planet Earth on Discovery Channel and I needed all that stuff, 4K is great. Um, but it takes up four times as much space on an SD card as well because it has four times the resolution as 1080. And a lot of people's devices don't even you know, don't even support 4K for the most part, so uh, a 1080 is, is really the way to go. How long has this thing been going? This thing times out at 30 minutes, so I had to restart it. Um, so yeah, yeah, 1080 is perfectly fine for anything any of us are, are gonna do. 4K come, can come in handy if you, if you do wanna zoom in on something though because then you can zoom in four times and keep the same resolution as 1080. So that would be the, the only thing to consider. But for me, the advantage, the, the, the small number of times that I would want to zoom in is far outweighed by the amount of space that I would want to save over the course of a year. So that's resolution. The next thing you're going to want to look at is frames per second. 24 is a typical frame per second for a movie. It's very pleasing to the eye. There's a little bit of flutter there, but um, it's just, it's what we've gotten used to watching movies in especially. 
30 is your typical frame rate for television. It's actually 29.97. If you want to go down a rabbit hole, YouTube, why it's 29.97. Um, it's, yeah, there's a lot of physics and science involved with uh, frequencies of uh, the, the waves that are being sent that, that television runs on. It's, it's wild. But anyway, we just ran it up, call it 30. So that's what most of what you're watching is in. If you've ever watched something and it looks super hyper realistic, like this is a little off, it's probably in 60. They do a lot of sporting events in 60. And the reason there are 120 and 240 is not because you'd want to watch it back at that frame rate, it's so you could slow it down and have it not look like garbage. I hate bad slow motion. It's a pet peeve of mine. <laughs> so um, I'll explain that really quick. I might have something later in here about slow motion, but since we're on frames per second. So as I said, 24 or 30 is typically what you want to watch something at. All my videos, when I put it into the software, and I've got clips from different cameras that are 60 frames per second, 120 frames per second. They're all on the same editing software in the same timeline. When I am done editing and I say, all right, make this a video, it goes through and it normalizes all those clips to 24 frames per second. So if I'm filling in 60 or 120, say 120, yeah, you've got 120 frames here, and all the software is doing is basically taking every fifth frame and just using that, and it's still nice and smooth, no problem. The reason you'd want it is if you want to slow something down, and I want it to be five times slow motion, real quick math, if you take 120 divided by five, 24. If you take 20, or let's say you take 30 and divide it by five, now you're at six. You're at six frames per second, and it looks like garbage. <laughs> so that's the, that, that like eh, 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 choppy slow motion that you see is because somebody had a clip that they thought was awesome and I'm sure it was and they're like I'm gonna slow it down but they didn't have the amount of frames they needed to do it to make it look kind of smooth. So that's why um, that's why I've kind of got 60 and 120 underlined there. The This camera that I use uh, for the, the chest camera, the highest it will go at 1080 is 60 frames per second. It's an older GoPro. Any of the ones that you guys said you have, the 5 and up, uh, are all capable of 120, 1080. But here again, I have two cameras up on a pole that are capturing what's happening in the front and the back of the boat. I typically do those at 60, just so I don't use up a ton of SD card. The cameras that I have on the gunnel that might have a fish jumping in front of it or you know something action oriented, a little bit more action oriented, I'll run at 120 so that way I can slow it down and have nice slow motion from it. Um, wireless, Bluetooth, any of the ones you guys have, are the fives and up are, are all Bluetooth capable, I believe. Uh, I really like using the GoPro app. I think it's called it's called something silly like Quick. Yeah, the GoPro app is called Quick. But you can link that up to your cameras, multiple cameras, and you know go through, I've got mine all just, they're labeled Angling Anarchy 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, whatever. I can go through, pick the camera, and without having to touch the camera, I can manipulate any setting I want to. I can start, stop recording, I can change it from looping video to regular video. It's a lot nicer than, you know, because a GoPro only has two buttons. So you can like toggle through things and then uh, um, like enter button. I screw it up all the time and it makes me mad, so it's just easy to open up the app. Boom, everything's right there. You can manipulate it that way. You can see what the GoPro is looking at. So these, like when I've got this set up in the boat, it's up about that high. I mean, if I really wanted to be a daredevil, I could stand on the gunnel and sort of get a look at the screen on the back, but I don't want to do that. So I just, I use the app, get them set, and away we go. Um, any of the cameras on the gunnel or anything, I can get to those easy, so I'll just use the screen. But it does come in handy if you want to have a camera set up, get it set, and then not touch it. Um, the app comes in really, really handy. Uh, I like putting all of my cameras in, uh, there. it's like a CNC'd aluminum uh, little case. The reason I do that is it lets air get to the camera so it will, they don't overheat. And it also, they've got these cool little lenses that you can put on. 
It's like a 52 millimeter lens. Most of my cameras have, uh, it's a polarized lens that I can put on and that lets me do that. All right. How many people have ever watched a video of a guy wearing a chest mount and thought, well, this is absolute garbage? Okay. I try really hard not to be that guy, but I thought the same thing. I would watch, do you know who John B is? Huge YouTuber. Um, he started out as a young kid in, I think, Northern Illinois. I think call him Fishing the Midwest was the name of his channel before he changed it to John B. But I remember watching him when I first started doing this and he was like 400,000 subscribers and he's going to little, he's catching ditch pickles. He was catching bass in little ponds in Illinois and he had 400,000 subscribers and it was with a chess cam. And half the time I was looking at the back of his reel in his hands. But again, he had this huge following and I just couldn't figure it out. Well, fast forward to, you all know Robbie and Lee, today's angler. Uh, I was talking with them and they had just fished with John and they were kind of picking his brain about YouTube obviously because he knew what he was doing. And he said, yeah, the footage isn't great, but the audio is amazing. And what I'm trying to do is go out there and tell a story about what happened. I mean, people might not realize it, but that's anybody that's out there trying to make videos is you're, we're trying to tell a story about what's, what happened throughout the day. And the best way to do that is with good audio, and the best way to get good audio is to have your camera right here or have some sort of mic. It just, it's nice to have the camera. So I may have gotten ahead of myself there, but anyway, um, we'll, we'll talk about the head mount. You see a lot of guys using head mounts. Uh, Doug Wegner does a nice job of using a head mount. And when I say that is he uses it to show the five seconds of good footage you get from it and then he cuts to another camera so you don't see all this stuff that's happening because it's like the Blair Witch Project musky edition. It's just, you get sick watching it. Um, it, it is nice because, it, especially for musky fishing, musky fishing is so visual. Um, you know, even if you don't catch a fish and you get a follow, that's usable content, I suppose you would say. So you, you want to get that shot and you don't want your hands in the way. So that higher perspective, no hands in the way, is definitely a plus uh, for the head cam. Yeah, it's a good way to capture following fish. Um, but let's go to the disadvantages. You have almost constant movement. So if you have just one camera uh, and you're trying to make a video, not the best thing. If all you're doing, and, and I'm kind of blur the line sometimes, I know most of you don't want to have a YouTube channel potentially, some of you just want to, I just want clips to show my buddies. It's better than a picture. I tell people, even if you lose a fish, you might get a spectacular head shake out of it. And now instead of having a story about it, you have video that you can watch yourself lose a giant fish over and over again. <laughs> and it's soul crushing, but we like to do it. So um, yes, the, that constant movement from the head cam, if it's your only camera, is definitely a disadvantage. The audio suffers a little bit. It's not terrible because it's close but it's not right here and if I'm fishing in the wind a lot of the time the winds to my back and I'll look at my other cameras and it's just all you can hear is this is nice and quiet because it's my body's blocking the wind for the most part musky fishing sucks bad enough most of the time I don't want a headache so I don't need to wear anything on my head um, I've had guys say oh you're already musky fishing it's painful just put a head cam no no, no. I'm going to be as comfortable as I can being tortured by these things. So I, I just, I can't do it. I know some guys have gone to putting a mount like through their uh, brim and putting it on their cap, but even that, it just, it seems like, seems like a lot to me. But hey, if they can pull it off, more power to them. Um, I, I won't like throw shade on anybody for using a head cam. I've had a lot of people come at me for using a chest cam. <laughs> You don't use the little sessions, the lighter session cams? I, I never have, and that's a good option too. Yep, yep, the little session cams are just a little cube. They're maybe half the size of a regular Still GoPro. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a little bit. So yeah, that's, that's the reason I, I don't, I, I tend not to, uh, not to use a head mount. All right, 
so the the chest mount kind of already went over this but you have superior audio from a chest uh, chest cam and one other thing that i do is so the the thing that looks like a dead cat on top of that is called a dead cat for reasons <laughs> um it just it covers up the microphone and it kills wind noise that you might have from it so what i did on this camera is I bought a sacrificial dead cat that I cut little pieces out of and I just glued it in the case on top of where the microphone is on this GoPro and that really helps uh, to deaden wind noise on this one as well. I find these really comfortable to wear all day. I mean it's not the best thing in the world but it's way better than a, a head cam as far as I'm concerned. You do have a little bit less movement because even if you're if you're fishing and your head's moving around this stays relatively stationary. So that's a little bit of an advantage. Um, and I do a lot of talking about what rod, reel I'm using, that sort of thing. It's more comfortable to talk about it here. People could see what you're talking about instead of me looking like an idiot in the boat and talking about things up here. I suppose somebody else could hold the camera, but I always like to say that because it looks silly. Disadvantages, if worn properly, down here, your hands are in the way all the time. And it's terrible. And I, like the GoPro chest harness sits pretty low. So I can see why people don't like it. Um, this one that I have was, um, I think Lee Tauken recommended it. Um, it sits a little bit higher up. And it, I mean, it, all it takes is a couple inches and it makes a, a huge difference. Um, and, and I mean, the disadvantage is at some point along the way, your hands are going to get in the way, setting the hook or whatever, but um, I think it's the lesser of two evils when you go back and forth between the two ways of um, wearing a camera on your person. I have actually found that I've I changed the way that I fish a little bit, and it probably I'm probably sacrificing a little bit, but I'm also trying to get something on film. I wouldn't expect anybody else to take their one trip a year and you know, only hold on to the rod with one hand, which I am prone to do because I don't want to have two hands in the way. Um, you know, I wouldn't ever recommend anybody doing that that isn't trying to make consistent videos. It's cool to have on your person, but don't let filming uh, override catching a fish, is what I usually say. And that's why it, even when, when I'm filming with a buddy, you know, I've had people say, oh, you want me to get the camera right away? Absolutely not. Grab the net. Let's get this thing in the boat. Then you can grab the, the nice camera and we'll take a look at it. If, if we can't get the thing in the boat, then we got nothing. So, or not nothing, but it's less. All right, as far as, as, far as mounting options, uh, you just have to get creative with it. Um, using the existing parts of the boats, the windshield, gunnel rails, anything that you can, you know, uh, let's see, I've got these little GoPro clamps are nice and heavy, they don't go anywhere. I mean, they they get pretty wide, so if there's a, a I mean, I, I can get these around some gunnels and stuff like that, so these do come in pretty handy. Um, a lot of times, a guy will have, like I, I don't know if you guys know who Colin Schlicht is, he guides over on Pewaukee, I fished with him a couple times last year. He's got a ram mount right in the spot where I'd wanna have cameras on the gunnel. So we just take one of the extended handles for the rod mount and put it there and I clamp two of these, one facing fore and aft, and there you go. Um, so it's, it's, once you start looking at your boat, there's plenty of places to, to slap a camera on. I use a lot of ram mounts. Um, they're very versatile, very secure. You can move them around. Um, again, the GoPro mounts, the clamp on. The sportsman's mount is what I use on this. It's actually, I think, what they built it for is to go on like a shotgun barrel, but you can put it on anything. I mean, I've seen guys put this on the rod so it looks straight down the rod. I mean, you can get some kind of cool different perspectives, but these are nice secure mounts as well, the, the sportsman's mount. And then of course, uh, you've got the Yolo Tech stick, which we already touched on. All right, so this, is what I use. It is three quarter inch conduit. Um, I was watching Keys Outdoors one day and I was wanting to get into filming 
and I was paying way more attention to how his cameras were set up than what they were fishing or where or whatever. So, um, and then I started just poking around stuff that I had in the garage. I had a ram mount for your trolling motor to keep the head from bouncing around. So I took what you would, the part that you would put on the trolling motor, put it on here. You've got the arm, it's a one and a half inch ball, so it's pretty sturdy. The other ball is right there, and I've got that screwed in actually to a uh, tight lock, one of these type of rod holders. I've got those bases all up and down both sides of the boat. Um, turns out, howdy, oh right on, thank you. Um, turns out the bottom of the ram ball has a little hole in it, and you can um, get a tap in there. And I just tapped it for, a, I think it's a 5 16 that goes in here. I got a stainless steel screw, epoxied it into the bottom of the ram mount, cut off the head to the right size, and now I can screw that down to any of these that I already had existing in the boat. Um, I have a 2004 Crestliner. Anything newer than that probably has the little rail system, so it's a little bit easier to, to do this stuff. I'm stuck with what I've got on the, the gunnel, but um, so that's how I've got it attached up here. And then on the bottom here, it's hard to see, but there's a little, I've got a little plate that this sits on. And then this thing on top is actually called a conduit hub. I was just wandering around Farm and Fleet looking for something that would hold the base of this, came across these conduit hubs. It's one inch in diameter. And I just drilled and tapped that for a couple of little quarter 20 set screws. So now I can have this in there fastened down. I've got it fastened down so I've got two points of contact. So now I've got something that's a lot sturdier than the Yolo Tech that just has that one point of contact. When I go to Eagle Lake, this gets put in the boat and it stays up all the time. Four foot waves, crummy weather, it stays up. If I've got to protect the cameras, I've, um, I should have brought those too. Do you know the bags that you get like linens in? It's got a nice little zipper on it. Save those. <laughs> they come in handy. The big ones for this, I can, I can cover these cameras, zip it up, I can run, no problem. <coughs> the smaller ones I'll put over my cameras on the gunnel, so those are handy little things to have around to cover your cameras up if it starts raining. Uh, for this, I actually built a little, uh, a little shield so I can fish in the rain. I just took a piece of uh, like eighth inch aluminum and made sort of a triangle piece with a hole on it so I can slide it over top and it creates like a little roof over it. And then I put uh, one of those little soft plastic cutting board uh, things and wrapped it around. So it's protected from the back and from the top. So I can actually, if it's not raining sideways into it, I can actually fish in the rain. So again, I, my brain starts roaming at work. And I'm like, I just think about that more than what I'm working on most of the time. Um, but yeah, so that's what I came up with, and this is what I've been using for seven, eight years now. Um, it just seems to work really nice. The downside was, is that if anybody else wanted to fish out of their boat, I was kind of stuck. I was like, well, let's, let's just take my boat. So there was a lot of trips to Ohio and stuff where I was like, mm, we'll take my boat because I, I need it to film out of. How's this thing doing? Um, and then, yeah, I've got uh, my uh, power cords. That's a 10-foot cord that I just wrap up and plug the cameras in with. And then I used to have, I think it was kind of down in the corner here, I used to have a, a little dual port USB uh, that I would plug those cameras into. The locators that I have now, I used to have Lowrance LCX 27s. They didn't take any power. The Hummingbird 12s, <laughs> it's a different story. Um, so it started happening where I would turn the boat on and it would shut my cameras off because there just wasn't enough power to go around. So I started running these two cameras off Milwaukee battery packs and then everything else off the little Anker battery packs. And that's the typical view that you would get from those cameras, so it does a pretty nice job. 
The gunnel mount I've played around with a couple different iterations of. Um, again, I've got my little tight lock rod holder base with a ram ball screwed into it, and then I actually put a little set screw so it doesn't back off on me. I've got a quarter 20 tap at home that's very well used for mostly this sort of stuff. Um, and that's, that's a one inch ball. I was just, I was, that, that's kind of what I was doing early on. Um, this was, was fairly sturdy and then I could just clamp on here. I had my two cameras forward and back. It worked really well. Uh, this is what I've started doing now. So it's the same, same deal, just an inch and a half ball and then the arm out to these two cameras. It's a little bit more secure. Um, but yeah, the, these are the cameras that are on the, the gunnel of the boat and basically just have them pointed down so it just catches just over the top of the water on the horizon and just the edge of the boat. So everything from here out is water and everything from here up is it's all catching what's ever happening out here. And typically there is, I mean the, the angles on these are so wide and I use the wide angle that if there's a fish right in the middle you one of the two will, will catch it. So it, it covers basically 180 degrees the side of the boat. And so yeah, you can kind of see I, I try to run it down the side of the boat um, and then just catch a little bit of the, because uh, it's always different how, you know, where people are standing in the boat. So you want to have it up a little bit higher rather than down a little bit too low. And of course, with the wide angle, you do get a little bit of the, the fish eye, but I'd rather have that than have it on the linear mode and kind of miss something off to the side. And most of the stuff is right tight close to it, so having that wide angle doesn't affect it very much. On the, let's see, for those views, I use the linear because it's back far enough that it captures everything that I want to see. Uh, so this was, <laughs> this was a couple years back. We were going out to Racine to troll for salmon, and I wanted just one camera, front of the boat, looking at everything that was happening. And I couldn't figure out what to do about it. So <laughs> this is my Minn Kota, tipped up, up all the way, and locked in, so it's, you know, about that high. And I just put one of the cameras on the clamp mounts on it. So we were driving around with the trolling motor sticking up, but that was my camera pole for the day. <laughs> um, but yeah. All right, I'm gonna go over a couple of different mounting options before we look at this. Um, one other one that I, that I use a lot, you know how I mentioned that I, I was hesitant to get in other people's boats because it was just, it was tough to film out of them. This thing, which I wish they still made them, is called an easy cam post. Uh, you can still find them every now and again. But basically what it's built to do is go over the post of like the driver's seat, take the, take the seat off, you can ratchet it down to the post. I mean, so even if it's on the floor of the boat, it gets your cameras up pretty high. Um, so this thing is a lifesaver when it happens to somebody else's boat. Um, what I've thought of doing if this thing ever takes a crap on me is, you know, really this part wouldn't be too hard. You could probably kind of fashion something out of wood or something like that. Uh, use a couple of just ratchet straps. So again, you can come up with stuff. You can come up with ways to, to do this. But, um, you know, if you got a painter's pole that extended and put it in a piece of wood, maybe used a, a hole saw to drill something that was half a half circle, it, it goes on these too. Like if somebody's got these rod holders, like when I fish out a Noah's boat, he's got a track system with a uh, net holder, nice and sturdy. I can plop this on there, ratchet it down, away we go. All right. The video that's in there is kind of junk, so I'm gonna. Okay, before we do that, oh, don't do this to me. Are you gonna let me play my video? No, it's not. He's good. He's good. Okay. How do I get out of there? Mm -hmm. Let me try something really quick.
I hope hopefully I don't jinx the whole operation. <laughs> it's PowerPoint. We're just gonna kill it for a second. Okay. Um, real quick before we look at, at what that was just showing, uh, here's a couple shots of my chest cam that I send to people when they're like, oh, you get nothing but garbage chest cam videos. No, you don't. <laughs> Boom. Right in the middle of frame, fish hits. I'm good with that. And, and again, the other thing I do is I don't have this pointed down. I've got it parallel to my body. That fish ran around like eight times on a figure eight. It was dumb. So if it is done right, you can get really good footage from a chest cam, I guess is my point with that. So Brian, when you're doing, I'm, I'm just going to throw this up at the head mount and the chest mount. Yep. I usually, this is always on wide angle. Yep, yep. So I get the max amount up and down. So this is 60, uh, just because it's a Hero 4. I, the Hero 4 Silver probably has the best microphone of any of the GoPros. So I've got like four or five of these that that's all I use them for is for chest cam. Uh, and that's the highest frame rate that you can get out of these. Otherwise, I would, I would run it at 120 if I could because I do get a lot of cool shots that are relatively close. Um, and then the two on the pole are 60 frames and then the ones on the bottom. And then I've, I've got another camera that I use for like B-roll type stuff that, I've, that I shoot at 120 with. So anything on you, you use wide angle? I'd use wide, yeah. Yeah, just to get the maximum amount of, sure. of reach. So. Um, so what that last slide that we were on, um, is talking about is using this as a way to make yourself a better musky fisherman. I know my figure eight got way better once I started watching all the screw-ups I was making. Because in the moment, you know, you do it, you lose the fish, you're like, huh, those muskies. And then you watch it like, huh, those fishermen are not good at what they're doing. So um, it, it really makes you kind of step back. You know, I always tell people, you're a football coach, this is your game film. These are your X's and O's. Figure out, you know, what went right, but also figure out what went wrong. So I started watching this, and my strong way to figure eight is to come in, out and around, hang it up in the top corner, and then set back this way. If I try to do it the other way, it just, it doesn't work. Yeah. Oh, sorry, bad way. This is like early, early video, but it's a perfect example. I cast out, my buddy sees a fish swirl, so I'm trying to get the boat perpendicular to the fish. I don't quite make it, so I have to go the other direction now. And I just kind of, And the other mistake I made is forcing the fish back to that side because my cameras are over there. So. I've gotten really good at not swearing too. <laughs> really good. Yeah, thanks Dave, it was a big one. I know, I realized that. <laughs> Dejected musky fisherman. What's that? So this, let me go back. Oh, are you gonna be locked up now? Ah, good, okay. So this, like the, the bottom of the cockpit is down here, which is what, maybe, 
17 ish inches and then it so it, it sits up on that uh, basically on the plane that you're standing on in the boat the top deck I suppose and it's probably well yeah so if I'm standing next to it and it's there that's how high it is in the boat six feet basically I'm, yeah yeah and um, <laughs> I actually I'd love to say that I left it there because I was smart but I just left it there because I was lazy this piece up here is actually a really nice lightning rod for other people to hit instead of the cameras. Uh, there's a lot of times that the boom, this gets hit with a bait because the guy in the back of the boat is typically right-handed, so they're casting over this way. But they get used to it. Pretty much anybody that fishes with me knows you got to deal with the camera now. So, um, yeah, <laughs> I went fishing with uh, Steve Jonasy in Iowa. Awesome guy. I love Steve. Fantastic. He hit the camera like 10 times. <laughs> or it was mostly the post, but um, yeah, no, it's fine. I like give him crap about that. There, that's that. All right, so other filming tips. Everybody in here has a smartphone, I'm assuming. If you have that and a GoPro, you have two cameras. The phones that they make now are amazing. They get really, really good footage. And if you go into the, I mean, even on auto, they're fine, but you can go in and, and mess with the settings and, and optimize them even more, just like you can a GoPro. Uh, for, for the longest time, this is what, instead of using that camera, I was using this. It was just a phone. This little guy is actually what came with this, because this was a chest mount for uh, a, cam or, uh, a phone. It just so happens that it will also accept a GoPro mount. So I took this, it's got a quarter 20 screw, which is your typical screw for any camera. Uh, screwed it on here, clamps your phone in. This is a little Rode microphone that might be different with phones now because a lot of phones don't have a, a port for audio, uh, but you could probably find something that's a USB adaptable. So you get good footage, or you get good audio. The phone's great. Throw a couple of little lights on here, and you're ready to rock. And actually, this I I still use this setup. I just put that camera in here because it's a lot easier to hold this than it is your phone or anything else, and don't don't need to go in the water. So these these are nice to have. These are like forty or fifty bucks. They make all sorts of different iterations of these little camera holders. But it's nice then because you can put your mic and a couple of lights or something like that on there. Unless you're making a TikTok, turn your phone and do that before you start filming. I can't tell you the amount of videos I've seen. They'll start filming this way and go, oh, that's wrong, and then turn it. Well, once you start it, once you commit, man, because there's no going back, you got to stop it, turn your phone, let it orient, and then start filming horizontally. Uh, already touched on this, I use the aluminum cases. Uh, you, you typically do get a little bit better audio out of your GoPros uh, if, if they're open and not. I don't even have any of them, but the, the old GoPros came in those little plastic snap cases, which were great for waterproof, but suck for audio. Um, it allows for the addition of the, the nicer lenses. Uh, talked about the piece of dead cat to minimize wind noise. Audio is way more important than most people think, and that's why you know most guys that are belly aching about uh, a chest cam, they're just interested in watching like the 10 seconds of the fish hitting on the figure eight, or you know you holding the fish up. They're not worried about the entire video. I'm worried about the entire video, so I, I, I need to have good audio. Um, you can have a so-so video with really good audio; people will watch it. You can have an amazing video, and if the audio is trash. Like, I can barely stand watching myself miss that fish for other reasons than the audio, but the audio sucks on it. But that was like, it's from a long time ago. So, um, another, another option other than the camera, and see, I, I like the camera because it's now saving my audio the same way that all my other cameras are saving the video. It's on a five minute loop, just like everything else. So I can line these little chunks up really easy when I'm editing. I know some guys, we'll use a separate audio recorder. So you can just get a little digital audio recorder, thro recorder thrown in your pocket, have a little lav mic right here. 
but now that's not looping. Now that is, you're trying to sync up this audio that might be five hours long with a couple little five minute clips. And is it doable? Sure. I just, I don't need to do it because I've got this. Plus, it's audio and if the video's usable, fantastic. If it's not, I still have the audio. So I, I still think it's a, a step up from just using an audio recorder. All right, as far as file storage and organization, you will fill up a computer real fast with your GoPro files if you don't have uh, a separate external hard drive to put them on. I typically, I've been buying the four terabyte ones now. They're 80 or $90. I think I've got seven or eight of them at this point. <laughs> um, but they, I mean, they hold a ton of, I mean, a ton of video footage. Solid state or do you? Uh, I haven't used any solid state ones. They're still all the old, old style ones. But uh, uh, I don't know if I've even got any with me. I use the, the Toshiba ones. You know, they're about the si same size as these little, little guys. Um, but they, they work pretty nice. <laughs> As far as organizing the files, I, the way I started saving them was I would have a trip, Eagle Lake, August 2018. And in that folder would be subfolders of muskies, walleyes, northerns. In those would be who caught the fish and the size of the fish. And then in that folder, it would be all the cameras from ca the capture of that fish. And that worked fine for a while. Um, and I think I've got a, another slide that shows how I do it now. Uh, but the most important thing is don't let files pile up because A, it's easier, just, just easier to deal with them, and B, I've got at least two friends that had a bunch of cool footage and they didn't put it on their computer and they kept filming with it and bloop, it's in the water now. They're like, oh, I should have just taken it off. Yes, you should have taken it off there and just dump your files. So when I'm on a trip, every night, everybody else is having fun, drinking, doing whatever. I'm sitting at the computer for about an hour dumping footage from all the cameras. And then when I dump the footage, you, want to, you always want to format the disk, make sure it's that one and not like your <laughs> external hard drive because I've heard stories about that. Um, but yeah, pull all the files off of your SD card, right click on it, you can, or however you can get to it, format and format them uh, because the looping process that we talked about before is hard on those because it's constantly rewriting over itself. So when you format it, it helps to just kind of clean the slate and make it brand new. And then it just, it just helps to organize things while things are fresh in your mind uh, anyway. So uh, this is how I store them now, just because most of the time I'm going on multi-day trips. Uh, again, what I, you know, Eagle Lake in August, and then I'll have each day and in each day, I'll have chest cam, cannon, bow, stern, gunnel forward, back, drone, slow motion for that day. And there's a lot of things I can't remember, but what I can remember for a long time is what happened in a day of fishing. So I, I usually don't have that hard of a time to just, if I'm going to edit a video, what I do is, I don't know. Okay, I don't have anything on that. Um, so a little bit, what time do we have? Oh, we got time. Cool. Um, what I typically do, my timing is impeccable. It's 20 minutes every time I've done that. Um, how many of you have used editing software? A little bit? Not at all? Sort of, kind of? Okay. Uh, yep. Um, so most editing softwares, you've got a spot where you put your files a spot where you can see what the video is, and then you've got what they call your timeline down below that. And it's as many timelines as you want, usually. Your, this is how PowerDirector works anyway. Let me go back maybe so we have a little bit of a visual. Okay. So it's hard to see, but you've got your this top little portion here is the actual video. The bottom portion, the wave format down here is your audio. I can go through, see these little like white dots here? I can manipulate those up and down to make it higher, lower decibel, or basically raise or lower the volume. So if somebody drops an F-bomb or something, I isolate the little wave format that's a, uh, 
and <laughs> I put a little dot on either side and I can drop the audio out and get rid of it so it's safe for the kids to watch. Um, so, so every time you put in your video clips, it's going to show up as, as kind of two parts, your visual and your audio. Here's timeline number two that would be down here. You can keep adding them as you go along. The way this one works is the lowest one down is going to be what you actually see. It'll override all the other or video clips. You can have them stacked on top of one another, but the one that you'll actually see is the lowest one. So typically what I do is, but all the audios will lay over each other. Um, so what I'll do is I'll usually put my chest cam first, and then either the bow or the stern, or maybe one of the gunnel cameras underneath it. And here's the really cool thing about most of these softwares, is if you have clean audio from both sources, and you want to try to line things up, if you highlight this one and, and the one below it, there'll be a little thing that pops up here that says sync audio. And when you hit that, it'll, it'll put the audio right on top of one another. If it doesn't do that, then you have to like start expanding things and, like, and try to find a discernible sound from both pieces of video and try to line those up. And that's a pain in the butt, but it can be done and I've spent hours doing that. Uh, so that's what you want to do. You want to, so if you, if you have two or three pieces of video, get your audio lined up as best you can so that it doesn't look like a Godzilla movie and the audio is over here and you're talking over here. Um, but yeah, and then, and then what I'll, I'll typically do is because I want to use this audio, once I get everything nice and lined up, I'll drop out the uh, audio from the other two pieces of video and then I'll start going through and picking out, do I want to see this part of the video? And then when I get to a point where I want to switch back to the chest cam, I'll just clip out that little piece uh, from maybe the bow cam, say, get rid of it. And then it, so it, as, as this little red line is going across and kind of showing you what's going on, it's going to be showing this stuff. As soon as this is gone, it'll go back to this. It's a seamless cut, but it's just nice. It, it makes your video a little bit more dynamic. You're not just staring at the same thing the entire time. It's nice to cut from the bow shot to maybe if, if you've got a clean shot of something from your chest cam. And this is a little bit more advanced than most people want to go, but I figured I'd touch on it anyway. So that, I mean, that's how I do it. I'm sure there's, there's just as many ways to edit as there is anything else. That's just, I, I self, I'm self-taught. I would watch, again, I would watch YouTube videos about how to do this. Uh, Cyberlink Power Director actually has a really good uh, YouTube channel. The guy's name is Malik. He's awesome. He'll show you how to do anything that PowerDirector is capable of doing. Um, but yeah, so that's that's a little bit into uh, how that works. Yes? How long on average does one of your videos take to edit? Probably, I've never really sat down and like timed it out. I just sit down and do it. It's, like eight hours. it's probably four to six hours. Perfect. Yeah, for, so, I mean, and, and once you get a little bit of a system down, it goes pretty fast. So, I mean, not that I want them to be stale, but I also want them to be consistent. I always start out uh, usually by saying something silly. So there's that, and then there's a slow-mo shot, and then my, I, I overlay like the angry anarchy symbol with some music, and then I go into my intro, uh, talking about what we're gonna be doing for the day, and then it's usually, this is what we're using. I'm talking about the bait and the lure, and then from there it's fishing, and then outro. So you, yeah, you got it. Uh, what about music? Are you going to cover that later in the presentation? So I'm just about done, and I was going to leave it up for questions because usually that goes for a little while. So uh, I'll just take care of that right away. I've run into problems because I used to go on. The, there's different YouTube channels that say they are um, like license-free or you know copyright free audio for a while yeah. until they decide they want to charge you for it. I've got maybe three or four videos that got demonetized, which whatever, it's not the big deal, because whoever owned that piece of audio decided they didn't want it to be free anymore. The best thing, I, the, the, what I do now, and there's, there's a lot of different subscription uh, places you can you know, pay 30 bucks a month or whatever, and you can use any one of their audio pieces, and they've got 
excellent stuff. What I do is just use stuff from the YouTube audio library. Anything that YouTube has on their site, uh, it's free to use, it's copyright free, uh, royalty free, and there, there's actually decent stuff on there. It's not just like stupid Winamp, right. you know, elevator music type stuff. There's there's some some decent stuff. Um, so yeah, that's 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 where I get the audio audio from that, that I use in any of mine, or uh, the the music. Just want to make sure. I Oh yeah, I could just go on Chat G GPT. Is that what it is? Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. I actually went on that. That. Do you know what Chat GPT is? I mean, they. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I went on there and asked it to write uh, an article about uh, filming muskies specifically, and it just. I sat there and I watched it. And it wasn't super specific because it's. I don't think they have it connected to the internet, technically. They, they're, there's a big database that it's pulling all this stuff from right now um, because they probably don't want like a Terminator 2 situation going on. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, I sat there and watched it. It made uh, about a 900 word uh, that would have been, if it would have been in like Musky Hunter or something, it would have been a little generic. But it, I could, I was like, that's a sp sports afield or outdoor life article 100%. With some copy editing, you can hit it oh. there easily. Yeah. I do all, all, tons of like legal opinions in it. Sure. All sorts of stuff. Yeah. So it's it's cool, but you're also going, well, this is weird. That's <laughs> it's it's wild. Um, so yeah, that was that was the end. So we were open for questions. Anything and everything. If you want to look at stuff. Where do you find your equipment? Like, did Lee help you find? Amazon. Oh, yeah. yeah. What's the brand of those aluminum? What is that? There are a couple different kinds. This one is Luxbell, L-U-X-E-B-E-L-L. -L. There's, what are these ones? I don't even know how to say that. Germoir, G-U-R-M-O-I-R. If you just, if you, well, again, if you go to any of the videos, I've got links for all the stuff. Yeah. But if you, I mean, if you just, I mean, Amazon's so good, you can type in literally what you want and it'll just spit stuff out. So if you just do aluminum GoPro 7 case, it'll give you all sorts of options. So. And what's the model of that? Is that oh, that's, that's a, a mirrorless a Canon M50. M50. Yep, it's, it was a really affordable camera. Um, it was about $500. It just comes with a, a kit lens that's a 15 to 45 millimeter. Um, it does a nice job. I mean, uh, what, uh, here again, uh, when I was doing research about what camera to get, uh, this one kept popping up sort of as the most popular, you know, like vlogging style camera. Uh, the only two things that it doesn't have that I wish it did have is it is not capable of shooting 1080 at 120 frames per second. The highest it'll go is 60, which is, fine for the most part. Um, I know a lot of guys will use that camera to shoot their B-roll and it would be nice to have 120, but I have a, uh, a GoPro Hero 7 that's just on a little handheld thing with a battery in it. And if I want to shoot something like some baits or you know whatever, I just grab this, somebody casting that I want to slow down. It shoots at 120 and that's how I get away with, with that. Um, the other thing it doesn't have is when you have when you're recording and you're looking at the LCD screen on the back, a lot of cameras will have the uh, uh, the sound waves on there, and that one has it. But you have to like scroll through the menu, and it's its own separate page. Um, if I wanted those two, but then I also wanted something that had the little LCD screen to flip out, so when I'm talking to it, I can see what's going on. I mean, technically, you can get pretty good at just looking at the. Um, at the lens and you're going to be framed fine, but I, I liked the fact of being able to flip that out and some of the higher end ones that were capable of those other things I was talking about didn't have a, a flip over screen. So it's like I couldn't find the perfect camera. And then, you know, to go to, you know, I've probably had that for three or four years now. Um, it was pretty, it was a pretty pricey jump to go to something that filmed 120 frames at 1080. You know, you're looking at probably $1,500. 
as opposed to five or six hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. So, um, but yeah, uh, as far as that goes, uh, a Hero Four Silver is what I have on my chest. Hero Seven Blacks are all the other ones that I use. It just so happened that when I was replacing all my cameras, the Hero Eight had just come out, so the Hero Seven Blacks were really easy to get cheap. Um, most of the cameras I've bought are refurbished from Amazon, and instead of four or five hundred dollars for a new GoPro, it was two hundred thirty to two hundred seventy dollars, and they just no never had a problem with a single one of them. I've I've had really good luck with them. Um, it, typically, they they just it's like in a, a, a refurb pack, so you don't have all the little bells and whistles. But I've got I've got boxes of that stuff already. The little all the stuff they send you with a new GoPro. I need the camera, and if they send a battery, great. If not, I just need the camera. Yeah. What's up with all the Hero 8s that are so cheap and everyone trashes them online? Oh, I don't know. I, I, you know, I hadn't heard anything real bad about them, but I'm glad I dodged that bullet. Because <laughs> I've heard that the 10s are pretty decent, the 9s and 10s are pretty decent. I, j I know that... Uh, Seems like everyone's selling their 8s too. Oh, okay. Um, I know the uh, the tens and the elevens are a little bit weird about how the it opens because I think to access the port where you plug in, you actually have to have the battery port open as well. It's a little janky. Whereas on the sevens, um, you know, I just I I usually just the little door on the side that per <laughs> supposed to protect it. I just pop it off and leave them open, and I just plug into the side. Uh, the, the downside to the 7s, because I was running all of the Hero 4s before, is at the end of the night, uh, the cameras that were on my pole, I could just reach up and I could pop the SD card out because that was open. To get the SD cards out of the 7s, I actually have to take them physically out of the case, open it up because it's right next to the battery in the compartment. But it's, it's not that big of a deal. Uh, I should have brought that. So what I, what I have is I bought a, a telescoping monopod. So basically, it, it works just kind of like this. And I just put a, a, a GoPro with a battery inside of it. The newer GoPros, anything five or higher, are all, as long as you have everything snapped together right, they're all intrinsically waterproof. You don't have to have them in a separate case. I've got a five that I put in a separate case because I don't, not that I don't trust it, but I just feel better having it in a case. Um, but yeah, if you've got all the, all the hatches and everything snap shut, they're waterproof just by themselves. But then I just, I have it mounted on the end of a little telescoping monopod. And when I want to get some footage, I just extend it out, you know, have somebody else hold it off to the side and, and just film away. So, is that what you're like for release shots and that sort of what thing? Or? What do you, what do you, how, what's the distance you can use from the side of the boat, water starting out? I mean, it, it all depends. 20 feet, 10 feet? Yeah, I mean, it all depends on the water clarity. Um, usually when I'm, I'm filming like a, a release or something, I'm probably, I've probably got the camera, like if this is the muskie's head, I've probably got the camera about that close to it. And then as it swims away, you kind of catch it. Right from the top, you're saying? Yep, so like if the top of this is the camera, so it's, two, two yeah, maybe. And you can kind of play around with it a little bit, but. Can you submerge that 10 feet? Oh, you could, yeah, yeah, yep, yep. Um, it, in fact, I was uh, doing some lake trout fishing, and we were, you know, f fighting the fish and sort of trying to half, there was only two of us, we were half net, half film some underwater footage, and we got some really cool underwater stuff. And then, of course, when we did the releases, you can kind of try to, once you let the fish go, try to follow it down because the water is pretty clear. Got some, got some neat shots. Opposed to Eagle Lake, you know, some of the spots are clear, some are not. So that's why we were pretty tight on the, on the muskie when we were releasing them, just to get a little bit of underwater footage. And sometimes it works, and sometimes you're like, this is going to be awesome, and you get it back. It's like, well, that's yes. garbage. <laughs> he's awesome. Yep, yep. No, Greg is one of the, the, one of the original guys that I started talking to. Uh, he's the one that uh, told me about powering the GoPros, uh, the threes and fours externally, uh, through the side here. Um, but they were having problems overheating, so I started doing research and found these, they're called Switronics battery eliminators. So I started running those for all the threes and fours that I had. And then I remember I, 
I was talking to Lee because we were trying to figure out how to how to power something on your body, and I mentioned to him, well, what about those little packs that they charge cell phones with? So I don't know. So I bought one and hooked up the Switronics thing to it, and I think I started because there's a, the old Switronics actually was the shape of the battery and you plugged, it was the square and you plugged it into the back of the GoPro and it had the little contacts on it. So I took a voltmeter and checked a battery and I checked what was coming through the pack out of the battery eliminator and it was the same thing. Cause I was like, are we gonna blow these things up or burn them out or, you know, so we, there was a little bit of trial and error there, but it seems to work pretty good. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot easier now. I like, I think back on all the crap I used to go through <laughs> power of these things, and it's. <laughs> what about like water wolves or anything? Do you ever use it like a trail cam? Like I've never line? used one of those, but that would be kind of cool. Like uh, the yeah, the water wolf cameras. So I was just wondering because that's the only brand I know of those cameras you can actually tie up and drag. Yep. Yep. Yeah. It'd be kind of cool to put it like behind a, a well, downrigger ball or something like that. Sure. Yep. That the too. Like that, they have the, the troll cams for yep. And I know. Um, I don't know if you guys know who Ben Stone is. He's a younger kid up in Minnesota. He does really like. I, I'm pretty good friends with him. He does some awesome videography, and he's got some amazing underwater shots of muskies trailing on uh, big suckers. Well, yeah, because I mean that's the thing I was I was wondering about the underwater because I fish a lot of stain lakes, and okay. biz lakes, and when you're six feet above the water, you can't see a fish that's two, three feet behind your bait following. So yep. that's where I was wondering, just putting you know a, a underwater like a GoPro on both sides. Yep. To hopefully capture some of that. I've considered doing that over the years, and I'm always afraid that I'm going to wrap something around it, or because I, I I've actually got the, my boat set up to have. Uh, it's it's a GoPro on a monopod extended on a ram mount that I can actually put down and sort of angle and have it like right there. So mm -hmm. if I got lucky and hit the right spot at the top of the figure eight, you'd capture. But yeah, it's like kind of how people are doing like a live scope. So yep. Like both sides. Too, yep. Just replacing that transducer with a camera. But yep. I mean they have the like the float housings for those, but I don't know necessarily if you pop it out. Yeah, the camera's gonna float, but then you gotta stop your drift or whatever you're doing. Right. Over. Right. So yeah, I mean, there's any, there's, uh, there's always the <laughs> uh, fear of dropping one of these things in the water or losing something, but um, no, yeah, yeah. yeah.